Thank you very much. Um, I came to Brooklyn early in the day to um, make an appraisal of the work of a distinguished artist that I've known for 50 years. And he was somewhat despondent because he was a friend of the radical years of the Depression. The fine Caribbean artists, and we were together in those Depression years, and when we were all so hopeful. I'm a great teacher, Willis and Huggins, who allegedly jumped off George Washington Bridge out of frustration. And because we loved him, we didn't believe it. We believe it was foul play. That's not the point we I'm driving toward. His point to me, because I came over to his artwork, one of our major unrecognized artists, is what was it all about? <clears throat> what did we do it for? Two generations of struggle and wishing and fighting to face a generation of young people who don't seem to care and older people who don't seem to care and don't seem to know we started the Harlem History Club. We was with um, an activist called Sufi, who in Chicago was named Reverend Cookshank, and who really started the buy black and don't buy where you can't work campaign. And we started the whole concept of Black Studies, two generations before this young generation started it, or thought about it. We were in the river to river picket line. We remember days in the Harlem community where blacks did not even close. On 125th Street, 10 cent stores on 125th Street, where blacks couldn't even have jobs or drive buses. In New York City, we were on picket lines, not trying to chase, not trying to impregnate every little girl we met. And we had dignity and respect and had youth. And now Reed is old and worn and barely got enough strength to go up and down stairs in his own home and he says, where's it all went and what was it all for? And we're facing a generation who's asking questions about a cop-out generation that's not delivering anything. We never heard of crack and We didn't know what marijuana looked like or smelled like. This is a dialogue between two men 50 years later. He came out of the Caribbean, I came out of the South. Both poor, committed to the salvation of our own people. Both young Garveyites trying to see what we could do to redeem our own people. Now we're asking, what was it all for? We put it on the line. What kind of work did we do? Scrubbing floors, porters, elevator operators and hotels, taking the insults, Surviving however we could. Now, 50 years later, 
we meet. He is a former fine artist, former art director in a major advertising agency. His family grown and gone. His wife's gone. He's had two, I've, I've had two. Children gone, mine about gone. None of his wives thoroughly understood what his life was about, none of mine either. <laughs> we could have done a whole lot of things with our lives. We could have said yes to the right people. Both of us could have been rich, because that's what we wanted. <laughs> we could have copped out, walked down easy street. We could have wrote we could have done, been the Cadillac route, <laughs> the glamour route. We went down the commitment route, trying to save a people. Amen. Now, what's this got to do with the speech? Probably nothing, really. Probably everything and nothing. Fifty years is a long time in the life of two people. When you've known two, when when you've known a person 50 years and, and you meet and start a dialogue, say what was it all about? What did we two people do with our lives? We were committed to our people. We served well. We served honestly. Neither one of us are rich or poor. And he was the irony of it. Both of us had brownstone house. <laughs> about the same type of brownstone house, about the same plumbing problem. <laughs> but the main thing, where have, what have we done with these last 50 years? What have we seen? We've seen two generations parade before us. What have they learned? What have they committed to? When we started out in the active years, the Italian-Ethiopian War. We thought Africa would be liberated by now. We've seen it go to the door of liberation and literally turn around or be turned around. We've seen the two branches of the African world, Afro-American, Caribbean, and Africa, get to the brink of liberation and let itself be turned around. Literally, we've seen God be betrayed. Yes. We've seen him betrayed by his own people. We've seen his dream turned around. And tragically, in his own country, a people who will elect a Siaga, producer Marcus Garvey, and elect a Siaga, a white man from Boston, have problems. Call him a Lebanese if you want to. <laughs> this is a job artist and a con man who came to Bar came to Jamaica to be elected. Learn Jamaican folklore, learn Jamaican dialogue, study Jamaican ease, study the politics of Jamaica. Studied the folklore and the ways of the Jamaican people, jived his way into the politics, and got elected. No black people. The folk ways, the color ways, 
their color pre preferences and rolled in on their prejudices. Knew that Jamaica was one of, one of the most color stratified islands in the Caribbean. England had made it so. All of this has to do with something. If Marcus Garvey were alive today and ran for election in Jamaica, he would lose. If Marcus Garvey were alive today and ran for election in Bedford Stuyvesant, he would win. Tell you something about the temperament of the Caribbean mentality at home and the Caribbean mentality away from home. A few years ago, Caribbean scholar Keith Henry wrote an article for me when I was editor of Freedom Ways called Tigers Abroad and Meek Moses at Home. I wouldn't publish it. I said, it's a good article, and it's absolutely honest. But if I publish it, somebody will have my head. Because it's honest, it's true. So why don't you publish it? See, it reveals something that none of us are ready to face. And this summer, last summer, in Barbados, on an intellectual tour, I delivered a lecture called The Caribbean Mind Away From Home, dealing with the fact that the finest minds that the Caribbeans ever produced never could function in the Caribbean. Marcus Garvey, and that the best minds who attempted to function in the Caribbean were killed in the Caribbean. The last example was the great Walter Rodney, yes. killed in the Caribbean. And their finest minds functioned outside of the Caribbean, and that black America became the beneficiary of some of these finest minds, starting with uh, Prince Hall, who built the Black Masons. And there, in Barbados, one evening, before I made the speech, I was speaking to an aristocratic woman, and I said that tomorrow I will speak on the Caribbean mind away from home, and I will start with Prince Hall, and I will end with George Lamon. And she jumped as though I had said something about her mother, that was unpleasant. He said, you dare mention the name of George Lemon on this island. I said, he's only the finest literary figure Barbados has ever produced. She said, that horrible man. He dared to say that tourism is horrorism. I said, what else is it? <laughs> I said, George Lamon is such a great writer. I was reading his, one of his novels, and he was describing rain. And he was describing it so graphically. When I finished reading the novel, I started outside, I went upstairs and looked for a raincoat and quite forgot that the sun was shining. <laughs> he made me feel that it was raining outside. That was greatness in writing. And she said, why not V.S. Naipaul? He has the English language so well. V.S. Naipaul is an East Indian who hates East Indians, West Indians, English, hates Indians, hates his own people, everybody else's people. 
Don't love nothing and nobody. <laughs> but he has the English language quite well. There is no humanity in anything he ever wrote. <laughs> All right, now, let's start the lecture. <laughs> Marcus Garvey is too important for delay. At first, in talking about Marcus Garvey, it would seem that I am talking away from the subject. But I will be talking directly on the subject all of the time. We need to place Marcus Garvey in proper focus. And to do this, we need to place the Caribbean people in proper focus. Therefore, we need to look at their here-ness in their now-ness. Since the election of Edward Siaga in Jamaica and the invasion of Grenada, there has been a major change in the Caribbean world and a change in an attitude toward Marcus Garvey. And one wonders if this change has made Marcus Garvey and his ideals safe among Caribbean people. One wonders if Marcus Garvey would be physically safe if he was alive today. He called for the unity and the redemption of the African world. We were not ready to listen then. There's wonder whether we are ready to listen now. He was not only ahead of his time, he was ahead of this time. There's an indication that the Caribbean people in participation in the forthcoming Statute of Liberty 100th anniversary might be missing the point. There is something at the present Schomburg collection called the immigration um, voluntary immigration indicating that the Caribbean people came here voluntarily separating them from the black American who came on slave ships. They're missing the boat because all blacks came out of Africa on slave ships. The slave ship stopped in the Caribbean and dropped those off and continued to the United States and dropped some off. The fact that the Caribbeans came later is another point. 
And except for someone pointing a finger and said, I'll take that one instead of that one, any Caribbean could be a black American and any black American could be a Caribbean. Amen. So no one needs celebrate and no one need to boast. All of us are victims of the same historical experience with variation. And no one need to boast or participate in the variation as though one is radically different from the other. The supreme test is this. Can you pass the taxicab test? <laughs> there was an argument in one of my classes at Hunter College between black Americans, Africans, and Caribbean. And I told all of them, and I especially picked those with black faces, not brown or almost whites or yellows. I said, I want all of you to go down and I want each one of you to count the number of cabs that pass you by before one stop. <laughs> Don't open your mouth. To, I want to hear no accent. <laughs> Just stand there and tell me how many cabs pass before one picks you up. 21 cabs on an average before anyone picked up any one of them. The Caribbean, the African, and the Afro-American. And when they came up, I said, I don't want to hear no damn argument about who came from what island, who came from Georgia, or who came from what part of Africa you are all African people, and that damn bigoted cab driver is a better Pan-Africanist than all three of you. <laughs> and once we understand that, we belong to the same African family, no matter what island you came from, what part of Georgia you came from, or what part of Africa you came from. And that is the essential message that Marcus Garvey was trying to get across to you. One God, one aim, one destination. And when you can't understand that, you betray Marcus Garvey. And that is the essential message. All right, now, let us proceed. What we have to understand with those who are participating in the separate charade around the Statue of Liberty that hasn't got a damn thing to do with any of us, that a decade after the arrival of the Statute of Liberty was a decade of anti-liberty all over the world for African people everywhere. Let's take 1886 and let's take the decade after 1886 and look at it all over the world and see what that decade means in relationship. In Africa, 1886 was the, begin the end of the long colonial wars and the politics of exile. The Asante Wars was coming to a close. 1886 the British burned down or tried to burn down the city of Kumase. 1885, they exiled the King Prempe. 
not only exiled him, but made him submit and forced him literally to kiss the shoes of the British governor along with his mother. Humiliated one of the most illustrious kings in all Africa. Around the other end of Africa, they had broken the last of the great, the great Zulu kings of Africa were being exiled. In East Africa, the Uganda kings were being betrayed, being betrayed by the Catholic Church and the British Church and the Arabs. Something else we haven't been able to do so. All right, in West Africa, Sumari Toure, Sekou Toure's grandfather was fighting his wars to stop the, the advancement of the French. In North Africa, the rift wars to stop the French in North Africa was still being fought. Further down the Guinea coast, Usman de Torador was fighting, was fighting the French in, in the Muslim wars. In the Sudan, the second Mahdi, uh, Khalifa, Khalifa Abdul Haya, was, was at war with the, uh, with, with the British. All right, <clears throat> the British were fighting to retake the Sudan. And this fight to retake the Sudan was after the death of the Mahdi and this war was reported by a young British reporter named Winston Churchill in a remarkable book called The River War, when a British butcher, Kitchener, went in to allegedly defend England's honor and kill 50,000 Sudanese in one evening and Churchill boasts of this in the book. We killed 50,000 of the big hogs in one evening. Africans were being killed all over the world. 1884, a degenerate Belgium king, Leopold, called a meeting and all the thieves who had not, had enough muscle, who had not taken part of Africa began to cut up the rest of Africa and there, therefore they got the Congo. The French got more equatorial Africa. The Germans got four pieces. Southwest Africa, now called Namibia, Tanzania, the Cam parts of the Cameroons, and uh, Togo. So after the arrival of the Statue of Liberty was an anti-liberty campaign against African people all over the world. Okay, here in the United States, what is happening? Booker T. Washington, the betrayal of the Reconstruction and the part of the liberty that we had won was going. And blacks who had won the right to serve in Congress were physically being driven out of public office. And near the end of the century, 1895, Booker T. Washington made his famous Atlanta speech. This speech was interpreted as he, as Though he endorsed Jim Crow, <coughs> a rash of Jim Crow laws came into being 1895, and most of the Jim Crow laws came into being between 1895 and 1900. 1906, beginning of vast race riots, the Atlanta race riots, the Riots against black soldiers in Brownsville, Texas, the famous Brownsville raid. Organizations coming to be, all right, the NACP, born 1909, 
No, you just count those 10 years after the arrival of the st Statue of Liberty, all over the world, we were catching hell. So what did liberty, what kind of liberty did it mean to black people any place? In the Caribbean fight for constitutional government fell on deaf ears. And the reform that the British promised was not delivered to the point that British governors of Caribbean islands had the right to even take their gambling debts out of the treasury of the islands and did. Now what in hell are you participating in the celebration for? How, what does, what does the Statute of Liberty mean to you? We are forever misinterpreting history. All right, Marcus Garvey was growing up in Jamaica, dreaming and hoping and seeing things much clearer than most people see things. Growing up, learning, growing up, looking at out at sea, dreaming of ships, learning his craft, shaping his destiny. Ultimately, he would begin to leave Jamaica, he would make his first trip outside of Jamaica. He would make a tour at a young age outside of Jamaica and indicative of his skill, everywhere he went, he found a job doing something. Watchman, running a newspaper. He was not unemployed any place. This is a person with so much native talent that everywhere he went, he inquired about the conditions of his people. A born leader with wild confidence in himself. This is his exception. Growing up in an island, highly color conscious then and now, because the color had made a deal with England to the point where England had granted the colors special job categories that to some extent they still hold, special professional privileges to some extent they still hold, literally creating a brown society in an almost white society with job categories. He came from a society of craftsmen that didn't have to apologize for his blackness. And he had confidence in himself and his skill to the point where he did not have to cater to anyone based on color. 
He had skills over and above that and rose above it. He had this kind of confidence and this would help him through life. And one of the reasons why many times he overplayed the color scheme in the United States is that the color scheme in the United States operated differently. The crude white men in the United States put all the color gradations in one bag and put one word on the bag. Nigger. No separate category, no separate neighborhood, no separate job classification. If you were poor, you all lumped together. Because the England, I mean Europe, dumped its human garbage can into the new world. America got the worst of the garbage can. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. The lowest white persons of Europe Yes. hit the United States. Yes. And this is something most people don't take into consideration that the black American got the worst white people on the face of the earth. <laughs> and when you judge the black American, understand he got the worst of Europe to deal with. Now, none of them were good, but ours... <laughs> just happened to be the worst of the lot. And Garvey never took that into consideration when judging us. And the ones we had to deal with as against the ones they had to deal with. The ones he had to deal with were brutal with a little style. <laughs> and how, well, no. In addition to misunderstanding the color scheme, he seemed to misunderstand the other social scheme of the whole, the whole matter. But now, and yet, from the beginning of his projection, he his greatest support came from black America. All right, now, this moves too fast because what we have to deal with is Garvey's learning years because he was a fast learner and he never took anything from a second rater. Like Malcolm X, he learned quickly and he never took from second raiders. Now, going back to England, we have to deal with Garvey's departure from England, Garvey's attempt. to find an organization in Jamaica. And when he went to England this first time, he came under the persuasion of an Egyptian of Sudanesian descent, Dues Muhammad Ali. And he worked on the newspaper of Dues Muhammad Ali, and he read, and he went to classes in England, but he learned well. And he became the beneficiary of the fact that several conferences had been held in England, and one of the conferences was the World's Conference on Race. 
That conference had been held in 1911. Now Garvey read these papers in these different conflict in these different conflicts dealing with race. These different conflicts dealing with race, especially the racial views of an Englishman of a world famous sociologist named Attila and the racial views of Du Bois. Now, these men had come from all over the world. Then, in the pages of Du's Muhammad's newspaper, the African Times and Orient Review, there appeared an editorial. The editorial was quoting, hear me well now, a white black nationalist. This was a man named Booth. He was in what is now Malawa, then called Naasalat. This man had grown dissatisfied with the whites in South Af Southern Africa. And he went through Southern Africa exposing them to the blacks. And he said, to the blacks, whites cannot be trusted. And he was angry with the missionaries, and he was exposing the missionaries to the blacks and telling the blacks that they can't be trusted. They're all a bunch of fakers. And when the, when the blacks asked him, can you be trusted? You're white. To his everlasting credit, he said no. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and he raised the question, Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad. That's what Garvey got the statement. <laughs> From the editorial about Booth and Dues Muhammad's paper, the African Time Orient Review. Garvey never took anything from second-rate people. <laughs> and when he took it, he molded it over and wrote around it and added to it theorized around it to a point where it became his own. And the world forgot Booth, who started it. <laughs> now, when Garvey came back to Jamaica, he tried to find the UNIA that failed twice in Jamaica. It would not grow in that soil because first, the political atmosphere of Jamaica partly bastardized by the color scheme Garvey could not sell blackness in the Jamaican soil of that day, and I question seriously whether he could sell it in the Jamaican soil of this day. But now, Garvey would become an admirer of the theory of Booker T. Washington. And he would correspond with Washington with the hope of coming to the U.S. to develop the funds to build a school like Tuskegee in Jamaica. 
He did not find the means in 1915. And when he came to the U.S. in 1916, Booker T. Washington was dead. When he contacted the people at Tuskegee, he could not get along or communicate too well with Major Moulton and the people Booker T. Washington left behind. So he came back to New York and began to put an organization together. And what we have to do is to look at Marcus Garvey in this, way, in this way. But you will not understand Marcus Garvey in the failure, in his failure in Jamaica without understanding the Caribbean antecedents of Marcus Garvey. To understand the Caribbean antecedents of Marcus Garvey, his failure in Jamaica and his failure in the Caribbean in general seems without logic. Because the Caribbean has a fighting heritage, a revolutionary heritage, stronger than the United States, longer than the United States. Why didn't his seed grow in that soil? And yet it did not. And probably will not grow today. Those specks of dust in the Caribbean Sea, those islands, once challenged and changed the world. What changed them? It was these islands that furnished the economy, that pulled Europe out of the lethargy of the Middle Ages, that gave Europe the economy to come out of those plagues and famines. It was also those islands that had the most enduring slave revolts in the history of the world. What happened to that spirit that failed to affect the wedding with the dreams of Marcus Garvey? It's one of the dilemmas in history. Why did it grow on this soil and not that soil? The soil that produced the Tucson and Loverture should have been ripe yes. for a God. Yes. When you look at the Jamaican soil that had longer revolts than Haiti, that produced the Maroon revolts, Mansong, and other rebels, the matter. I mean, Jamaica had revolts lasting 200 years. The revolts in Haiti generally, really, it was over a 20-year period. And that's the success of the Haitian Revolt, the fact that it was almost a poly, like, uh, and, and step by step, over 20 years. But Haiti had a damn fool Napoleon to deal with, and, uh, but the British could release soldiers to stop the Jamaican revolt and Napoleon was so tired over so many other things by the time he could release soldiers the, the, it was too late. And Haiti was the beneficiary of a fortunate circumstance in history Jamaica was not. You have to study the entire spectrum to understand that. See that but to understand you have to study Marcus Garvey's antecedents in the Caribbean. 
Now you have to look at his antecedents in the United States. Lord, to understand why the seeds of his ideas grew here and not in the Caribbean and would not grow in the Caribbean today and might grow here today or might not grow here today might not grow in Africa might not grow in either one of the places today because Nkrumah preached them and preached them well and yet Nkrumah who preached them well was overthrown by anti garveyistic forces. This has to be taken into consideration. We have to understand the counter forces within the African world. Now let's look at the antecedents of Marcus Garvey in the United States. Let's look at the ideas that preceded God in the United States and how the scene was being prepared for Marcus Garvey 100 years before his emergence in the United States. Let's look at the first half of the 19th century. The slave rebel the black free man and let's look at the beneficiary in the United States of the Caribbean thinkers who did not function in the Caribbeans and might not have might not have been able to function in the Caribbean look at Prince Hall from Jamaica from Barbados who came here found the Masons why didn't he find the Masons in Barbados where he came from? Look at Peter Ogden from Antigua. Came in and found the Art Fellows. Why didn't he find the Art Fellows in Antigua? He came here and found the Art Fellows. Look at Robert Campbell. Who John Ruswa, who edited Freedom's Journal. He's from Jamaica. He edited no paper in Jamaica. He edited one here. Robert Campbell, who went with Delaney to search for a place for the settlement, Abakuda in, Niger in uh, Nigeria. And these Caribbean figures joined with African-American figures and thought that both of our problem was one and the same and they were right. Yes. Now look at the Caribbeans who left the Caribbeans, joined with black Americans as a union to pave the way for a back to Africa movement almost a hundred years before the arrival of Marcus God. Look at the Caribbean figures come here to build an antecedent to Marcus Garvey a hundred years before Marcus Garvey got here. Left out of history. And some of them, the first half of the 19th century. Now let's look at the second half of the 19th century. Some of them still functioning. Then we look at the Pap Singleton movement, the second half, looking for internal settlement in the United States. Then the external settlement, the Chief Sam movement. This is a Ghanaian named Chief Sam who said some boats would come to pick us up. Many blacks sold all of their furniture and everything and gathered at Galvester, Texas and other spots waiting for Sam's boats to come and take them back to Africa and Sam's boats never showed up, of course, but it wasn't his fault, see, the people of Wellstone 
never, the boats never got there. But the Chief Sam's movement was a big movement. It was a back to Africa movement. And Bishop Turner's movement. All of these were movements that appeared generations before Marcus God. Now, after the end of the century, the riots early in the century, Marcus Garvey arrived in the country during and soon after the World War I. He made his first national tour, 1917, during the riots, 1919, the Red Summer, riots in Chicago, the famous and tragic riots in St. Louis. Now Marcus Garvey's message is getting across. He goes to Chicago and tells blacks that they don't want you here. Not only let's get out of here and go back to Africa, our home, let's get our own boats and sail back on our own steam. Blacks in the Caribbean may not have wanted to listen, but we listen to anything now. <laughs> Can you understand why we would listen? <laughs> This ain't happening in the Jamaica. They ain't burning, in, in East St. Louis, they bring bonfires and throwing black children into the fire. Yeah. This is not happening in, we are willing to listen. Because certain things are happening to us that's not happening to any other African people in the world. Newton Baker, Secretary of Treasury, tell black soldiers, some of them being lynched in their uniform, that your lot is not going to change by virtue of you fighting in the war. Du Bois has issued a statement called Close Ranks. Let's close our ranks and help America save the war. Du Bois goes and investigates the condition of the blacks only to discover that on the battlefield Many blacks wounded are left there to die because Red Cross won't touch a black body. And he want to take the statement back by closed ranks. Closed ranks for what? Now you can see how the atmosphere in the United States is produced to receive a Marcus Garvey different from that in the Caribbean. Yes. But we are willing to listen by virtue of our condition that is distinctly different from the condition in the Caribbean. <coughs> we are ready for anything by virtue of what we have to deal with as a difference because the British have made some fake promises in the Caribbean. And the British are making <coughs> schoolmasters and constables and, you know, and clerks in the, in the court. And you got the superficial appearance of nation, you know. But we don't even have the superficial. And this superficialness give them the illusion of nation. We don't even have the illusion. So we are willing. Marcus Garvey said, come on, let's, let's, let's get out of the ships and get the hell out of here. We said, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> Now you can see why the largest organization ever built before our sentence is built by Marcus Garvey, mainly the black American following and black American money. 
and that the whole concept that he found black American with a wishbone and gave them a backbone is a lie. He found them with a condition created by the bigotry and the racism of black, of white America that made them reach out like a drowning man at anything that looked like a rope. <laughs> and neither the Caribbeans or the Africans have understood the kind of condition that white America put us in that made us appreciate a Marcus Garvey over and above that of the Africans and the Caribbeans. And most people who write about Marcus Garvey hadn't seen that. And probably because eight or nine black American aristocrats wrote the government by getting Marcus Garvey out of here they have interpreted that as meaning all America, all black America, betrayed and wanted Marcus Garvey out. Most black Americans, with any understanding of Marcus Garvey, was for Marcus Garvey. Yes. And still are. Yes. Yes. <laughs> And so we have to take it beyond conversation. We have to look at the man. We have to look at that convention of 1920, one of the largest, probably the largest convention of black people ever held anywhere at any time. 30,000 people in old Madison Square Garden and in turning away 30,000. Power that frightened the government of the United States. And when you go through the files of the FBI, he was the most watched human being by the government of the United States ever. In the files of the United States government, after they censor and take out and cross out those who informed on him, do you know what's left? The government files that are left. Do you know if you purchase the files in the, under the Freedom of Information, you know it's fourteen hundred dollars. The pages that are left, and they crossed out probably two thirds of them. It was probably under surveillance more than any other single, more than any other single man. Now, after this convention, he was probably under more trouble, in, in more trouble. I think the steamship line was built too hurriedly, and because he did not examine the ships, most of the ships were poorly bought and was not examined for seaworthiness. And they gutted ships mostly had formerly been used by bootleggers for running rum back and forth in, in the Caribbean islands. And he couldn't do that today. I mean, now all ships had to be certified for seaworthiness. And in that day, you could have had a ship certified for fifty dollars, and because Garvey didn't want to be bothered with the white people certifying anything for him, he just bought them, you know, and and uh, and he just bought them and paid the money, and you know. But now, the, uh, a, a ship have to be certified, and the electronics have to be certified, and. And whether you like white people or not, <laughs> a person, a person who, with the skills to do that, have to do it, whether he's white or not, yes. and whether you like it or not, that's the way it's done. Yes. Or you don't get the ship. 
and the person that certifies the chef is responsible if something goes wrong. So therefore, if something goes wrong with the electronics, the person that's certified can be sued or lose their job. Well, anyway, some of the sea captains betrayed Marcus Garvey and some of them stole money from Marcus Garvey and several went into real estate with money stolen from Marcus Garvey. And, um, but Marcus Garvey was an honest human being. He, he really, he, he did not live elaborately. He lived in a very simple apartment and he was not a big liver as a person. And uh, I've talked to both of the wives and that's a separate thing in, his, in itself. And it determined the future of a man is sometimes determined by the wives he choose to stand beside him and he chose two good women and um, in the final analysis they didn't particularly like each other because Amy uh, Ashwood who started out with him and helped him build the movement chose Amy Jakes as his secretary who and, he finally married Amy Jakes and that angered Amy Ashwood who wasn't too happy about losing him and she called Amy a Jakes some names which were kind of unprintable <laughs> <laughs> as almost any woman would when she loses a man she wants but, uh, and uh, doing the research on the book that I did on Marcus Garvey and I uh, I decided that I would not print these things that some things need to be left out of history yes. Yes. I purposely left it out what those two women said about each other yes. and I interviewed both of them yes. I had 36 hours of uh, Amy Jakes on tape and I didn't include any of it in the book, except her political views. And Amy Ashwood's tape was, I gave it to someone to copy, and they pretended they lost it, and I think he was a liar. I think, I think he's got it, and it was the only tape in existence. So it was only eight hours, but it was only tape in existence. And, I trusted it with a brother who works at a broadcasting company and he said that someone took it. I think I think he got it. I think it it represents the disrespect of a brother to it. Yes, it does. It, uh, well anyway, it just it just taught me a cruel lesson. But no, the main thing is that the argument over the ships mismanagement of the funds led to his imprisonment in Atlanta and this led to a pardon and deportation by Coolidge pardon by Coolidge and deportation and after the deportation the movement began uh, to decline and his return to Jamaica the uh, second Jamaican years when he tried to rule the movement from Jamaica it was not successful. He ran briefly for public office and that wasn't successful. He was elected once and the second time on a technicality he was not um, re-elected. And he uh, he uh, went back to his trade to pay off his debts and decided to go to London. And when he departed for London, newspaper men got around him and wanted to know if he had a statement to make. He said, yes, get around. Yes, yes, I got a statement. Listen, take, write this down, write this down. They all prompted to write the statement down his great departing statement before he went to London he said 
Jamaica is a ridiculous country. <laughs> End of statement. <laughs> Now, his years in London, the editing of the Black Man magazine, the years of sadness, years when he was highly critical of the Italian Ethiopian War, critical of Haile Selassie for leaving, years of ill health, and years of When he came to Canada um, when he could and people would go to Canada and see him. He used to come maybe every other year. As a string of reporter, I went on one of those journeys and saw him. He was um, angry and bitter and rather obnoxious. And disappointed and somewhat offensive, you know, accusing everybody of betraying him. And he was probably right. And I tried to understand that man who had dreamed of turning the world around and who had invested so much in the hope of a people. And now, asking people why didn't they collect the basic monies for the subscription to the magazine, like six or seven dollars that they were supposed to collect and had not collected and reduced to arguing about petty things. It was a, it was a sad occasion. And sometime I regretted that I had gone but it was the first and only time I laid eyes on Marcus Garvey. And while I regretted having seen a, a great man in this condition, it was at least the one opportunity in my life to have seen him. And I never corresponded with him. But he would go back and talk in Hyde Park. But this this man and his hopes and his dreams was to change our world around. And he would inspire in Nkrumah and he would inspire most of the African leaders. Now the political meaning of his life for today is that everyone who has dreamed and hoped for our people have not been able to avoid Marcus Garvey, what he meant what he meant to the Caribbean islands, what he meant to the African world. And if we are ever to be anything whole as a people, we have to come back to this man and his bold dreaming. And everyone who has said anything to our people meaningfully has said, in essence, part of what Marcus Garvey has said repeatedly, up, up, you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. Thank you.